Uh, but as we're welcoming people to this webinar, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope that you've been able to listen to all three of the pre-recorded presentations uh, from Rachel Weber, Don Carter, and Ray Gastel. Uh, they are hosted on the NICP YouTube channel, in case you um, are tuning in and haven't been able to hear that, that background. I want to thank the National Council for Preservation Education's conference committee for putting this together and especially Julie Johnson for helping with the uh, technical items uh, and including doing this webinar and getting it recorded and uploaded to YouTube. This too will be available on the YouTube channel in case you missed this. So for our audience members, for our participants, please, please send questions our way. Questions either that arose from listening to the recorded lectures or that come up um, based on the conversation that we engage in now. If you use the Q&A feature, I'll be able to track those questions as they come in and be able to present them, present them to um, our, our esteemed guests. I have a question to lead off with, which is something that I received uh, from Sean McGee. Sean asks uh, of Rachel, did your research reveal if tenants of historic buildings from nearby small or medium-sized cities were enticed to move into new speculative office space within Chicago, or was the movement into new construction made primarily by those tenants who were already located in the city? So did Chicago's speculative boom come at the cost of nearby munis municipalities and their historic buildings? Great, thank you for the question. Um, uh, you know, I recall that I was studying the boom that preceded the last one, right? So what I call the millennial boom, which I date from about um, 19, 1999 through about um, 2009. So during that boom, and the, you know, based on the data that I had available, um, I would say that it was the majority of um, relocations that took place into the new speculative construction. Um, these were corporate tenants that were coming from elsewhere in the loop. So they were coming from, in some cases I mentioned, uh, like the, the chicken that crossed the street, um, you know, or the, the um, they were coming, they were, these were micro moves. In some cases, they just switched those little, those four digits at the end of the five digit zip code. So the data I was able to map um, and the corporate tenants I was able to track um, the majority of moves were these quote unquote sort of micro moves where they just moved within that, the sort of the four digits following the five digits of the zip code. Sometimes they moved, yeah, they moved across the street. Um, they were moving primarily from the center of the city, from what we call the, the central loop to uh, sub markets on the periphery of the CBD. Um, so, you know, they were, uh, so there were certain, some sub markets that were clearly being sort of depleted of tenants and there are others that were more likely to be receiving tenants. Now, as I've tracked this issue going into the, the boom that followed this one, so the one after the global financial crisis, um, there seemed to be more relocations from the suburbs, from the region of Chicago, McDonald's being the largest one. So McDonald's traded in a manicured, uh, you know, corporate um, uh, office park in suburban Oak Brook for a downtown location, a new construction building in the West Loop. Um, but they were just one of many larger corporations that moved in um, from the suburbs to the downtown. So there's a question of whether or not sort of overbuilding during one boom sort of accommodates, you know, suburban to urban relocations in subsequent booms. Yeah, and if it's just a swing back and forth, one boom right. draws people out of this. Right, I was going to say that was also pre-pandemic, right? So everybody's talking these days about the whether there will be a continued relevance of downtown office space and whether or not these suburban submarkets um, and office parks that were really hard hit in the 2000s and 2010s, whether or not we're gonna see a reversal now if people are not willing to take transit um, and commute from, from suburban locations or from the sort of periphery downtown. And I mean, Chicago has a kind of classic um, hub and spoke type of um, transportation network, both um, 
you know, highways as well as, as transit. And uh, the pandemic is certainly making people reconsider, reconsider that urban structure. Don, I guess to follow on the cities that you were looking at also had um, a great bit of uh, dynamics to their populations. I know that as you were introducing each of the cities you talked about, we gave a year and a peak population and then a current population. Do you think any of this pattern of pinging back and forth between small perhaps cities, but city centers, urban, large urban centers, rural, do you think there's any of the dynamics that we're talking about in, in the cities you examined? And you're still muted, so if you could begin your response again, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, it applies to the European cities I looked at, American cities, fairly large ones, as well as to the smaller towns that surround these big cities. And there is a kind of in-migration and out-migration that goes on uh, from the central cities to the suburbs of each city. Um, uh, Turin is an example, I think, where there became a kind of um, class struggle because the central city was 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 becoming more and more prosperous in the 90s and the in 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 this century, whereas the working class suburbs started to deteriorate. A lot of the factories had closed, and there became a political battle about where the money should go. You know, should it be creating jobs in the mid middle of the city. Or should you be creating jobs in these working class suburbs around Turin? And I think we found the same thing happening, certainly in our Pittsburgh region, uh, uh, with the five case studies I talked about in my talk, um, the small river towns. And uh, there's a push and pull between the affordable housing you can find there versus public investments in these communities. And some of, the, some of these small towns all of a sudden become destinations for young adults, young professionals, and then comes up the specter of gentrification. <laughs> uh, so there is this, this, this movement uh, within metropolitan areas and then the movements from metropolitan areas to other ones. And uh, um, it's, it's dynamic because people can vote with their feet, at least in these democratic countries. There are, like in China, you have to have a work permit in order to live in the big cities. Whereas in, in the Western democracies, you move where you want to move, where the best jobs are, cheapest housing, whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, Rachel points out that on top of all that, there are these institutional forces at work that are beyond knowledge of the average person. I mean, mortgage-backed securities kind of changing the real estate industry. That, um, that's a force at work that I'm glad <laughs> that you studied that, Rachel, because... Uh, kind of opened my eyes a bit about what was actually happening with these uh, B and C level buildings in, in our cities. Pivoting to you, Ray. Uh, in Ray Gatskell's presentation on the Pittsburgh Produce Terminal, he noted that the effort to reuse this large property had taken more than a decade tying into one of Don's comments that uh, some of these redevelopments of cities takes uh, a long-term vision and, and some patience. In a recent announcement, we learned that the 21st Street end of the structure is expected to open soon with outdoor dining and retail. Given the size, what ongoing discussion is there about other uses in, in the terminal or other very, very large scale uh, empty buildings? Thank you, that's a great question. There's a, a few questions in there. One is the time dimension, and I'm gonna say something quickly about that that you all know, but the, the really that the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, took over the terminal in 1981. It was, uh, it, it did have some use continuing, but most of its body of its historic role as a wholesale market was gone. And so it's really not just a six year or a 10 year project, it's really been almost a 40 year project to find a successful use. There was a, in, there was a very successful use for one portion of it as a contemporary craft uh, art center. But, uh, but in general, the vast, the vast portion of that 1500 foot long building was either non-tenanted or seriously under-tenanted for 40 years. 
So patient money is a key to all of these projects. And of course the patient money is either with a government entity or a public private entity, rarely with a kind of straight ownership uh, model or just a private ownership model. That said, the tenancy of this is interesting. The, there is an agreement with the Urban Redevelopment Authority, which uh, has a, the, the developer McCaffrey has a 99 year lease uh, on the property. Um, and the, the agreement was that he would seek to get 40,000 square feet of those with local uh, businesses local, uh, that were not national chains. And he's working to honor that. We have a, a, a sort of a plant, a sort of urban plant kind of a store called, it's actually now based in Lawrenceville. It's gonna open up a space down there called City Grows. And that's gonna to be towards that 40,000 square feet. There's also, but there's also uh, kind of trying to have some sort of connection to the local in the sense that there's the brewery, the district brewery, which is actually a Chicago based company, but it's still of course gonna have local beers and so forth. The, I think that what they've found is they're walking a careful line. On the one hand, people don't want them to imitate the businesses that are already in the strip because the strip has this along Penn Avenue has these historic really, you know, decades old family owned businesses that are in food. And at the same time, you want to be authentic to the character of the strip. So it's kind of a it's, it's, a, it's a fine line that they're trying to walk both in terms of tenants and in terms of character, in terms of the, so the whole identity of this terminal project. But you can, you know, the reality is uh, they've used it for temporary uses like that have been, uh, or, and they've, they've, they've thought about it, not just the tenancy inside the building, but also the temporary uses outside is one of the ideas they had and creating enough space that they could actually pull that off was part of the, one of the planning strategies for the overall project. So I think they're gonna, there are, is a market, they are finding tenants even in these uh, tricky times and because they are really in a location which makes sense to a whole lot of the population as a kind of desirable destination, both for visitors and also across the street, one of the major autonomous vehicle companies in Pittsburgh has made its headquarters in the other McCaffrey project at 1600 Smallman. So there's, a, there's both the kind of the long-term population that's going there. There's also the new residents of the Strip and there's also the new commercial residents of the Strip that are all sort of seen as having a stake in this new, this new project. I want, can I jump in, um, Amalia, just to, to ask a follow-up question? Ray, I was fascinated by this project. I mean, just, you know, because of the scale, because of the location. And I do wonder, um, you know, in terms of maybe a connection to some of the work that I have done, this idea that these kinds of single story um, types of spaces, industrial spaces are, you know, we're sort of obsolete. That's one of the reasons why a lot of industrial users move to the suburbs where they could, um, you know, develop these purpose-built types of, um, you know, larger or larger spaces, or you know, I guess the yeah, just the the dimensionality of these spaces were were apparently not um, intended for the the demands of the kind of contemporary industrial user, and therefore that sort of label of obsolete seemed to sort of stick to these older, um, both sort of retail and, and, you know, industrial warehouse kind of spaces. But I wonder, again, these days with uh, um, the fear of elevators and the fear of, um, you know, people are talking about this, whether or not the, the office building will survive, you know, the sort of downtown, whether or not we're going to move from skyscrapers to streetscapers, I've heard the expression, I'm not sure if I like that term, but to sort of, you know, large single story or maybe just two story buildings so you can avoid the use of um, elevators. And I do wonder if you think that it's possible that, um, yeah, industrial tenants may be attracted to such a space as opposed to some of the other uses um, like, you know, restaurants and retail that you were, you were mentioning. Well, uh, gosh, it's a, a lot of questions in there too. <laughs> I'm thinking about the best response. The, um, what I'd say is this, as you know, like a lot of the uh, industrial, it's not, as you, as you were getting to, it's not really about the multi-story issue. It's really that you just wouldn't make this long and skinny building today. It'd mm -hmm. just be a very unlikely profile. You would make it a much, the dimensions would be more orthogonal, less, less or still orthogonal, but less dramatically uh, longitudinal. So, but I, I think that, and also this one is odd because it's all an elevated plane. I mean, it's all because mm -hmm. it was for loading. I mean, it's mm -hmm. at the level of, of, of offloading a train from its original purposes. So uh, I think that what's, 
I think we are going to see a lot of, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's fear of elevators. I think that there's a lot of ways that people are looking at uh, streets and sidewalks and kind of the first couple of stories as buildings in a new way. There was recently a really fascinating panel called um, Is the Future Flat? You know, borrowing from Thomas, uh, the, the New York Times columnist, but then translating it to not of the kind of social flatness or political flatness, but rather literally that people are going to occupy. And that's in part because of uh, COVID and because of the kind of there's going to be more times when you don't go inside a building. Or if you do go inside, you don't want to go through as many uh, airlocks uh, or whatever it might be. But I, I, you know, I think it's actually amazing. I think that the, the the current moment has changed in Pittsburgh. People are outside eating in 50 degree weather. This is not something that people on this side of the Atlantic do. I mean, that is that is that is a pretty new thing to do, uh, and it's happening in part by this you know tragedy, which has sort of stimulated it. But on the other hand, I think people have begun to look at the the way they use the outer doors differently. And I think these older historic buildings like this, if they are in an urban setting, are extremely attractive to people for that type of interaction. You know, I was, I mean, I mean, this is, sounds corny, but you know, I was up at a building that was retrofitted a number of years ago, but it was an ice house in, um, in uh, Lawrenceville. And they're literally, you know, outside on the porch, you know, doing the kind of, at sort of three, three feet above street level, practicing, a Chinese New Year dragon dance, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like uh, cities don't get better than that, you know, like that the, there's a sense of that kind of shared life that, I, you know, I have high, you know, you have to believe in. And I, I think older buildings are one of the great places to provide that. Mm -hmm. I also find it promising that while multi-story, the this location was very attractive in the kind of other, the building across the street, which is more of a classic, you know, multi-story warehouse kind of building. And I don't know if it's attractive because they're taking so many floors that people know that they're just going to, they may go into a different floor, but they're with the same company. I don't know how to translate mm -hmm. that exactly. Hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Anybody else, Don, have anything to add to that discussion? Anything to jump in? If so, I'm in the room. No, I have nothing to add to that question. Okay. Well, then we've got a question coming coming your way next. So Don Carter's comparisons of post-industrial cities emphasize vision, community cooperation, investment in heritage and leadership. What measurements are being made to allow us to evaluate these efforts? For example, how many low-income residents have gained jobs by virtue of these efforts or, and, or what other measures are being used to tell us uh, that these cities are coming back? That's an excellent question, and um, metrics are important. Uh, and I kind of got wrapped on the knuckles. My book was reviewed in the Journal of American Planning Association, JAPA, by Paul Farmer, a close friend and colleague for many years. And he was the CEO of the APA at one time. And he raised the exact same concern. Uh, where are your metrics? Um, so uh, in, in um, have to be honest, <laughs> in my book, I didn't get much into metrics of success. But if I had, I would have looked at longitudinal data on employment, personal income, in migration versus out migration, um, educational attainment, new companies, um, effect on housing, public safety, uh, and even in environmental conditions over time. Uh, and of course, overlaid on all this is issues of class race and place and you know where people live relative to environmental degradation versus nice places or gentrifying places. So it was, it was kind of a hole in my book. Uh, and if I wrote the book again, I'd probably do more metrics. Now I had guest uh, authors on many of the chapters and I would have had to go back to each of them and, and say, we do, we do need to look at metrics. But um, it's one thing to say, Liverpool has come back. Another thing is say, well, measured against what? Against Manchester, its neighbor, or against Liverpool 20 years ago? And then what are those measurements? And uh, uh, I think that's a, a, a good question to raise. And I think the, the areas of investigation that I listed would be the ones that came to mind for me as to how we could at least judge the success probably against the own, the, the city itself. How was it 
40 years ago and what's happening now in terms of the population, employment, uh, tax, or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I wish I had somebody like Rachel on my team <laughs> who could help me figure out these met matrix, uh, these metrics and, and do the correlations that need to be done, including comparison to other cities. But my gut reaction is I'd want to compare the city to itself. How successful is it now versus the way it was 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago? But I'd appreciate Ray or Rachel helping me on this. Well, I, I, could I, uh, Amalia, I just thought I'd raise one or two things. Uh, first, um, I, I haven't dived into a deep study of them, but I'm very interested in, in doing a deep dive on the city of Oakland's equity metrics, which mm -hmm. they're using for their, all of their development projects at this point. We had a lecture at, at uh, School of Architecture in the, with uh, Bill Gilchrist, who is now the city of Oakland's planning and development director. And so and he, he sort of gave us a kind of outline of it. And so I look forward to, because there are metrics you can use. Because I came from the New York, my first planning job was New York City which had the socioeconomic chapter was a required part of your environmental impact statement. And that uh, and those socioeconomic chapters basically set up models for calculating various impacts. And I think that that's, there's two things there though. It's one is the models that calculate kind of ab abstractly what might happen. And then you judge your project on that way. But then there's also what, what happens when your project's actually built, especially if you're aiming to have a positive impact on local employment, et cetera. And those can be done. City of Pittsburgh has a, a metric that isn't really meant to be applied on a building per se, but is on overall trends in the city of a social equity indicators in terms of like, you know, health performance and access performance and political participation performance and so forth. And those are really meant to be judged every couple of years through 2030 to see if in 12 years we got anywhere. How we plug individual projects into that we also have a model which is called P4, People, Planet, Place, Performance, which was developed actually as a kind of tool that the URA was going to use and is still using, is using to some degree. So there are ways you can do this. And I think that, um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can, something like Hazelwood Green is going to be looking that overall project where the, that piece, the, the large mill building has the sort of buildings inserted into it that I showed at the has will be measured for those kinds of achievements that will be part of their the analysis of both the folks that are already in there you know does the advanced robotics manufacturing and the, the catalyst and the various other folks actually any of their programs to engage local employment you know do they get anywhere people are going to be looking at that and those will be measured uh, but two things one is like trying to measure the future which is you know a predictive uh, process and the other is trying to measure the results. But I do think they're both, uh, I think we're getting closer to that. Hopefully we'll do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm us with process, which is the problem with the, those kinds of initiatives, but they are important. Yeah, I would just say um, that it's really difficult to measure on a project basis the outcomes. We see output, meaning like we built this project, we'd re re redevelop this you know, old mill, um, and we had these tenants moved, move in. Um, and so you could, but th whether or not that's a sort of net gain in employment is a big question. And I think that's what some of my research shows is that we, we, we may treat it as such, but if those jobs just moved from another part of the same city or from the same urban region, it's not necessarily a net benefit or, you, or an impact you can't count it as an impact of the project itself. You know, I work with a lot of, lot of economists and regional scientists, and we do this kind of um, retrospective economic impact analysis. Like, did this particular government intervention help? You know, was this, and, and it's very difficult to develop those kinds of causal models um, retrospectively at the regional level, just like, you know, trying to find matched pairs of cities or neighborhoods, one that used this particular incentive and one that did not, um, and trying to measure whether or not the incentive or this intervention was causative, you know, whether it was really that or some other secular trend that caused employment to go up or property values to increase. So this issue of causation is like the Achilles heel, you know, for 
people, you know, in my little segment of the planning world, the sort of economic development planning world. So it is really hard. I mean, in some ways, these like the sort of the call for metrics strikes me in some ways as being kind of performative, you know, it's like we have to say that we've done, it, it's sort of, it's a way of sort of forcing people to do their due diligence or to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, cautious, cautious about claiming, you know, some, you know, amazing impact or effect, but, you know, uh, my statistician and economist friends will of, often sort of poke holes in, in, in the metrics and say that unless you can design this kind of, again, sort of retrospective statistical analysis, whether your models are robust, like it's very hard to claim impact, um, especially on a sort of project by project basis. I've received a question that, that's following up on Ray's, which is, Ray, are there rep repercussions if a project doesn't meet the goals like you're describing when measured? Are there repercussions if some of those goals aren't met? Well, um, I, I'm going to, there are, in a performance-based zoning model, there are repercussions. Like if you, if you said that you were going to uh, apply, um, I don't know how the clawbacks work exactly when the building's built. But if you said you're going to have, uh, but they, they, they can be though, because you can't say that you're going to do this stormwater system or this, you know, those kind of, or, or this kind of, or provide affordable units and then not provide them without repercussions, you know, and get the zoning benefits from that in a performance-based zoning, a kind of incentive-based zoning model. So that's one type of repercussion. You say you're going to do something, you don't do it, there is a repercussion. Uh, usually the remedy is not to tear down the building, but there's usually some kind of, of, of remedy. I think that also in the model that they're developing and you know the kind of equity uh, review is like is potentially a project could be uh, turned down. You know, if you have a very weak kind of sort of and without you don't have a mitigation, I don't know if they're using the term mitigation, but it would be, it would be appropriate. But if you don't really have a, a much, your project's gonna have a, a bad impact on affordability in the city of Oakland and you don't have like a plan for how you're addressing that, I don't think your project's gonna go forward because like, no, like just like uh, anything, you don't take it to a vote if you don't have the votes. Uh, and I think that that's, so I think there are real, you know, repercussions, which some people might feel inhibit, you know, and from a business development perspective, but at the same time, when you're a city like Oakland, uh, you, you know, that's your, the priority right now is to make sure that there's a kind of, you know, that you go from the tech into tech witty, you know, there's sort of a equitable, aspect of the development happens in that city moving forward. So I, I think that there's a, there are real consequences with those types of reviews. Those types of, some cities call them filters, like Seattle often would call it a filter. And if they didn't turn it into a formal EIS kind of requirement, they would still, that sort of socioeconomic impact can be, you know, you can either figure out a mitigation towards it or revise the project. And those are, those are impacts and they have happened in our, in city government. Yeah, I would say, you know, I've studied economic development incentives and the difficulties in actually clawing back the incentive once it's been given have demonstrated to cities that it is better to do what Ray is, you know, saying that either, you know, it takes place in Oakland. I know in Seattle, they've done this as well with these sort of equity goals, which is that you don't distribute funds. You don't distribute public funds until there's a certain, um, you know, certain benchmarks or metrics have been met. So that, you know, that could be the affordable housing uh, or it could be a certain number of jobs, you know, local hires. But I think, you know, cities have learned the hard way when they kind of provided, um, you know, these big, uh, you know, sort of firm specific subsidies up front and then said, you know, we're going to watch and see if you do anything bad down the road and we'll, and we'll claw it back. But then there was always a loophole. There was always a way to kind of wiggle out of that claw back. You know, you'd say, well, you know, there's a recession taking place or, you know, it's a pandemic or in our, you know, we lost market share. And so we had to do X, Y, and Z. There's always a reason to forgive that kind of claw back requirement. So I think, you know, when we talk about sort of smarter incentives, they're the kind that wait for the recipient to do something um, before, you know, any monies are allocated or before, um, uh, you know, permits are approved. So see the behavior first and then provide the kind of leniency or subsidy afterwards. 
might be sounding familiar to students familiar with the historic tax historic credit. Right, exactly. Um, and I was just gonna bring to this conversation a little bit of a rhetoric question for the preservation students out there asking how we measure whether preservation has been adequate in the city, right? How robust, how active, how successful is, you know, preservation in any given, any given city? Um, and what the metrics are for that, you know, some ideas about tax credit dollars being captured or number of historic buildings that remain occupied, et cetera. Anyway, uh, we have another question from the audience, which is asked for Don, but I love this, everybody jumping in and adding and filling, filling them out. So Gabe asks, one of Don's 10 lessons mentioned, invest in culture, heritage, and quality of life. Many of these once industrial hub cities have seen demolition by neglect, resulting in a loss of built cultural heritage, built culture and heritage. How would you tackle re-energizing a city that has lost a significant amount of culture and heritage, uh, which was once showcased through the built environment? Unmute. <laughs> keep, keep myself off the thing, okay? <laughs> um, so that's a good question. And a lot of these towns uh, are struggling. There's no doubt about it, big cities and small towns. But in terms of present, you know, preservation, um, there, there's, there was a major effort in each of these cities to kind of build on existing heritage, but also to create new institutions and cultural experiences. Um, and these are not just projects, but they also build community pride and they raise hopeful expectations for the future. So it could be um, the Elper Dock in Liverpool, the Olmstead Parks in Buffalo, the Roxy and Theater in Mickey's Rocks, the Simple Gaia Suda Indian statue in Sharpsburg, the major project, the Cultural District in Pittsburgh, the Inchette Factory in Turin, and the Flood Museum. Johnstown, just a few examples of that. So um, what's the role of preservationists in all of this, and where should they apply their efforts? Um, uh, you have to, you have, it's a contact sport in a way, urban design and, and city planning, and you have to get in there. In short, I would say um, the main thing, you know, and, and I'm redressing this to preservationists and, and historians, you have to be part of the process, you know, and you can, you can be an advocate for preservation practices and not be adversarial. I mean, in many, in many instances, we find that preservationists are saying, don't do this, don't do that. And they get that reputation for, for digging their heels in and saying it only can be this way. And I think that engaging in the process uh, is one way to do that. And I think the lessons learned uh, that I think mostly apply here for this question would be, you can't do it alone. You have to be part of this process with the citizens, with the government organizations, the institutions that are already there, engaging with the citizens and, and, and be seen as, as listening. You know, one of the things that it, we've always taught our young planners when they worked in my firm was that the most important thing you, you have is your ears. Just listen, you know, don't be telling people things, listen to what they think is important about their city, the park, that building, whatever it might be. But be behind them all the way and in investing in whatever culture and heritage and quality of life they might be trying to preserve there. And, you know, and Ray and I are in this business of being architects and planners and urban designers. Uh, align yourself with the best planners and designers. And be part of a whole team of people putting together these efforts. Um, so I like it when preservationists are at the table from the very beginning. When I was in private practice, we would often add a preservationist subconsultant to our team, especially when we were working in very sensitive communities. And uh, they paid off big time for us. And um, your research is, is really invaluable. And your documentation, kind of helping with historic designation, precedents of other cities that people can say, oh, that's what they did in Nashville. That could work here in Birmingham. In fact, that was one of the things we did in Birmingham. They said, well, Nashville did this. 
And Memphis did that. Why can't we do this here in Birmingham? They're all just two hours away from each other. Preservationists have learned a lot about financing and about grants. So um, those are important. And sometimes I think the value of preservationists is to get there before anybody else. I mean, you're tracking things and all of a sudden you see a great asset that's under assault and maybe the community's not paying attention. You can come in there in an educational format, an awareness format. So uh, I'm not sure that answered the core part of the question, but it's something that I've been thinking about because the people we're addressing here are in the preservation world, both teaching and actually consulting, and maybe you're even um, parts of development teams. And I just like it when preservation is part of the team in a cooperative um, um, mode rather than a kind of adversarial mode. Ray, were you gearing up to say, to add anything? I'm gonna try and be brief. I just, I, I, I agree with Don and I just, it, it, I think if you wanna avoid demolition by neglect, especially in a city or region that is not prosperous at the level of a Seattle or a Austin, or, you know, you can, you can name the, the sort of, uh, even Nashville has sort of today emerged as a city that has a very prosperous, um, the, where there's sort of more resources to dedicate to uh, preservation as it's traditionally construed. But when you think about demolition by neglect and you look at the, the range of our, of our uh, region that like we're in, or even in Pittsburgh itself, you, to avoid the demolition by neglect, you need a big tent version of what preservation is. It has to be, I, I, I think it's really, and one of the reasons that I did the, the focus that I did was I think that if you're gonna create the, save this enormous steel shed, you're gonna to have to have some open-minded ideas about what you're gonna put in that enormous steel shed. If you're gonna like have something like the terminal, which has no real meaning to its upper level because you're not loading trucks on it anymore, you're gonna to have to be a little bit open-minded about perhaps a connection and extension of those platforms in order to create some kind of connection to the street and the public realm. That's not true for all buildings. There's always buildings that you, know, you wanna preserve as absolutely in, in every, the most rigorous historic preservation model possibly. But there's a, you know, there's always the, the truly physically important or culturally important. And so you, you need to create every aspect of it uh, as intact as you can possibly make it uh, during its period of significance. That said, I think there's gotta be, if you really want it, uh, you think about, we have all stretches of, you know, most of our housing was built before 1940. Uh, and like, if you want those to be preserved and so forth, and as, as well as the churches and everything that went with those communities, which are often about half the size they were historically, it's gonna take a very big imaginative leap of like how many things can help us, you know, have a broad version of conservation, which incorporates historic preservation in its classic and most rigorous sense, but also has, sort of openness to some other other patterns. So uh, that's something I feel pretty strongly about just because of the scale of what we're challenged we're facing. We, um, for short, Andre, I, students and I sometimes talk about that not every building gets A plus preservation, right? Not every building gets the most um, careful, ideal version, right? There are some compromises that sometimes need to happen to make, to make a project work and to bring all the team members like Don's talking about, yeah. Anyway, uh, sometimes they're just sheer pragmatic compromises that are not necessarily making a fantastic building. Sometimes there's a different interpretation that makes a fantastic building because it's more of a kind of interpretation than a uh, preservation. Both, I just think there's got to be a big menu and people that are committed to preservation need to kind of find different places in that menu and kind of, because it's a big project, you know, uh, adaptive or use will save the world. So uh, if for, in terms of embedded energy, so it's gonna be a lot of work. So we've got a, a different, different versions of the role. I, I would add, um, I don't, my German's horrible, but there's this concept called um, Zwischen Benutzung, which I think means sort of an in-between use like a temporary use, you know? And I think um, oftentimes our, our legal system has a hard time accommodating these, you know, whether it's a pop-up, this or that. Um, but it strikes me that, you know, if you're moving from preservation to sort of conservation mode, then even a temporary use uh, can be something that's helpful in just kind of activating a space while you buy time or, you know, 
Um, and it seems like particularly in, 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 in cities like Berlin where they really advanced this concept, it did wonders in terms of attracting artists to the city, you know, they, they basically allowed all these like older industri industrial spaces and these old sort of public housing complexes to be taken over by, by artists. Now, that was a kind of temporary fix because as prices increased and Berlin became hot and cool and attractive, prices went up and the, you know, the owners of these spaces returned to kick out the temporary uses um, as soon as they could find a paying tenant. But um, that strikes me as, you know, a maybe a stopgap measure um, when you talk about this, uh, you know, preventing demolition by neglect. I could add into there again as well. Um, uh, Ray and I both know Maurice Cox, who's now the planning director. Planner. Yep. He, was planning, he was planning director in Detroit, mm -hmm. and he was also in New Orleans. So uh, he's been in a lot of interesting cities, even Charlottesville, Charlotte. Um, in, in Virginia. So uh, in, when he was there in Detroit, I mean, they had so many empty buildings all over the place, closed factories, main street, little neighborhood main streets that were empty. And that's exactly what he was doing. He, he would allow people to come in almost rent free and do something, you know, start a little company or sell fruit or whatever they wanted to do, make uh, leather belts or, or, or just set up something going on. He figured, why, why not get started with something and see if other people join in? Now, I don't think he's had the success that Berlin's had in Detroit, and maybe he's going to try the same thing in Chicago. I don't know. But, uh, uh, that, was ex you know, that was exactly his strategy. Rather than tear the buildings down, let's see if somebody's willing to do something there for now, whatever it might be. As preservationists, we love to think about layers of time, right? Like which period of significance is important, but also how are the layers um, over time, the kind of accumulation of multiple different uses. And so I think this idea could fit into that also with acknowledging that, okay, this is gonna be a brief layer, but it's still an important layer in the, in the evolution or in the uh, overall arc of use of a building. Great. Um, well, we're coming up on um, towards the end of our time together. We've got another 15 minutes or so. Um, and I had one question prepared that I wanted uh, that sort of ties together everybody's in some ways, but also gives you each a, a chance to respond. Um, so one of the things that we noted in each of your talks is that uh, everybody, and, and we sort of got into this conversation already, um, but everybody calls on preservationists and preservation educators um, to grow past their sort of most traditional or narrowest roles that preservationists sometimes play. Ray has called for kind of embracing change and adaptive use, like we just heard here a little bit. Um, Rachel, at the end of her discussion, asks us to also start thinking about new construction and, and sort of how that pulls or draws from older building stock. Um, and Don's presentation talked about heritage and really thinking about historic resources and heritage as part of creating a quality of life that helps to revitalize cities. Um, and so this, this kind of question perhaps, perhaps already answered to some degree, but I'll give you a chance to take a very direct shot at it if you'd like. Where do you believe preservationists should best apply their efforts in your vision of uh, the developed environment? Excellent question. Okay. <laughs> Who wants to go first? I will, I mean, go for, oh, okay, go ahead. I, I think I, I did talk about that already in, in my long-winded answer, which is uh, they belong there from the very beginning. They can prod the project into, into being considered important. They can be a resource for local communities, whatever, whatever it is. But uh, the, the point is to be part of the process. And uh, um, I, I just have always... Um, valued the, that, inf that information that they have and the expertise that they bring. You know, it's not just about the layers of history, but it's also about even the use of materials, the proper use of materials, even graphic, you know, concerns. Uh, how do you um, 
celebrate this this building, this place, this park, this this parkway or whatever it is. You know, um, do you uh, do you have signage? Do you have uh, explanatory material along the trail that says there used to be a Bessemer furnace here? These are all things that uh, enrich what a developer might be doing or a city might be doing. They don't see the whole range of how you tell the story of the site or the building. And, and that's the expertise that you have, you know, in spades compared to most other people. So it, it enriches whatever the preservation, adaptive reuse historically or almost historically, it enriches that and it informs it in a way that um, is another layer of information as you go on down the line. 10 years from now, people look back and newcomers are seeing something that they thought was always there. No, it wasn't. People 10 years ago actually saved this thing and here's how they did it. And this is how it changed um, all of that. So it's not just the documentation up to now, but the preservation of the documentation in the future of whatever it is you've done um, so that others can build on that layer further on. So it's a, it's a it's a it's an essential part of adaptive reuse for sure. I would say, um, you know, and I I will again fess up to the fact that I'm I'm not a, a real historic preservationist. Um, I mean, I that's where my heart is, but that's not what I necessarily have studied. And so I guess. I'm, I guess I'd be pushing um, historic preservationists into this sort of new-ish, potentially newish area by saying that if you're going to intervene to, you know, in terms of adaptive reuse or, you know, responding to sort of the call to arms to prevent the demolition of a cultural asset, then you are de facto involved in constructing the the market, the property market, not just, you know, with specific kinds of buildings, but you're intervening in this sort of larger interconnected whole. And I would like to see preservationists play a more active role um, in the sort of new construction um, uh, sort of side of that, of that real estate market, because I believe that what happens there will affect, it will reverberate um, because of these in, the interconnectedness of markets to the buildings that you maybe you start off caring about. And so I guess I would like to see preservationists apply their efforts at the level of um, planning and permitting the new build. I, I feel like, you know, in the same way that we do sort of environmental impact studies, and there are sort of, you know, you know more than I do, historic impact studies, but often when new construction is proposing to replace a historic building. But even when there's no historic building to replace, even if a new de if a developer were building on a vacant lot, what they build is gonna have an effect on that market and may cause other buildings that are currently not threatened to become so. If, um, if it does, if, if you have an economy that's either stagnant or just not growing as quickly as the new build is, as, as new buildings are going up, then you're going to have this, um, you know, sort of uh, musical chairs type of game in, a, in, in, you know, in a downtown like I was looking at, or eat, but even at the regional level. So I would, I would like to see preservationists fight for uh, mechanisms that would uh, force developers of, of new construction to measure what the impact of their new build would be on historic buildings, either neighboring buildings or, or buildings that are in the same same sort of building type, um, or you know to ask them where they think their you know are their brokers where their where their tenants are going to come from, and if a large percentage of those tenants are going to come from historic buildings, shouldn't the developer of the new build be forced to, in some ways, internalize that negative externality, right? So is there some way of, you know, creating some kind of a linkage program, a program where a developer of new construction contributes to a fund that helps with adaptive reuse projects? 
products in the in the sub in the sub market. So I'm I'm thinking creatively or like cre creatively here, and I don't know, um, I don't know if you can tell me if that's something that has been tried um, in either cities in the United States or cities in Europe, which I think have done a better job. I mean, I think in Europe they make it more expensive to build new, and so I think there there is there is. Um, maybe a premium placed and more attention placed to, you know, your cultural and historic assets because it is so hard and so expensive to um, get new construction off the ground. And so there are ways we could do that here, everything from like monetary policy at the national, you know, level to, you know, um, you know, and raising, raising interest rates to um, trying to work that at the local level. But I think it's very hard when individual cities try to do those kinds of more punitive types of growth controls um, because developers can just say, well, I'll go somewhere else. I'll, I'll, I'll build my building in Nashville or in Pittsburgh instead of Chicago. So that's, that's I guess, what I would, um, uh, that would be my contribution to this question. Great, thank you, Ray. A couple of things. One I was thinking is to uh, go to the owners you're preservationist, it's time to sort of like the, I just think about literally the hundreds of churches which are slowly crumbling to the ground in the region that I live in, right? And you need to, and people are scared to death, you know, because there's very bad blood with like some of the, the diocese and others over preservation issues. At the same time, I think that you just have to figure out a way to talk it to you. Get, government can't go just sort of just choose like it's just going to focus on churches or whatever. It has to make it a larger program so that it's not division of church and state. And it could be, but there's so many things, whether community clubs, the, the associations, there's sort of these public or semi-public buildings, which there's just hundreds of them that are at risk. And how do you really get beyond that? And partly it's by having a real conversation with you know, as churches like have contracting um, congregations and so forth, it's a very tough discussion about, and you're asking them to do something. If you go out and sort of, you know, put a preservation on their buildings without having some kind of plan for it, it is, it is, it is, a cha is a problem. And so I think there is work that people are doing, but I think it could be brought to scale. I think there needs to be more because I think it's really facing up to these kind of unusual buildings we have, which are often truly impossible to figure a new program for the sanctuary in certain ways. Although there was a nice article to, uh, like yesterday about all sorts of great ways for reprogramming sanctuaries, which is you know the big volume of space that's really hard to figure out how to use. And so I, I just think that you need to go to like the big players in that, you know, who has these portfolios of historic buildings, whether it's an industrial development corporation, whether it's churches, whether it's a school system, and just push them somehow without sort of the, before you go to the lawyers, there's got to be something before lawyers and Pittsburgh did a historic version of this. It's a legacy that I inherited and it was, it's better than not having done something like that before the lawyers, but I still think there needs to be more. And I think for preservationists, they should really focus on who, who's in control of this huge stock and be realistic or uh, imaginative about what all the different ways you're gonna have to deal with it. Secondly, I think with the whole question of, of uh, you know, nothing new really, but that equity is a kind of primary goal, we're gonna see some pushback against government money going into, uh, you know, sort of whether or TIFs or whatever it is, there's going to be some pushback about things like that vis-a-vis uh, -vis preservation at certain points if it's seen as like not um, adding to, uh, you know, contributing, you know, so that it contributes to the tax base or whatever may not be enough of a consideration when you're really trying to say what is the positive, not just the, not a negative socioeconomic impact, but what's the positive one, which is a long way of saying that if you're interested in, um, communities that are uh, underrepresented communities uh, that are, you know, what they're, I would dive in deep and I think a place preservations have a lot of work to do and they're doing it, but I think there's a lot more work to do is like, you know, draw the lines between preservation and equity and communities, uh, underrepresented communities and where are they gonna fit? Where do they fit now? And where will they fit in the future in a kind of alignment of remaking cities in a way that is seen as more equitable? 
And, you know, because as we know, a lot of great historic buildings are translated into like wonderful new shopping centers and so forth. And I, you know, I, I lived that, you know, I grew up with that in the Seattle and all sorts of other places. And here in Pittsburgh, that's part of the story too. And I don't, I, I think those are contribute to the city. I don't think they're a negative, but at the same time, if you're trying to see you know, where, you know, what is it? Is it the schools in those in neighborhoods that are underrepresented and the resources that could go to preser preservation of those? Is it, uh, is it a different model of how you adaptively use a school? What, what are those things? Again, work's being done on this, but I would be bold about it and like really kind of make that a, a serious focus for today because I think that you find as you get into it that preservation is actually shared as an interest across many demographics. A lot of different people are very interested in it. But if you're not there to kind of like help that conversation happen and you don't empower those communities about, you know, to be, you know, their own preservationists and in and, and their own value system of it, you're not doing, not doing what you need to do. So that's my, my hope is like that kind of the sort of the empowerment model, which is now an important part of planning in communities, always has been, but more, you know, has some new, new, I think also needs in a, whether it's through the sustainability is the overarching piece or whether it's over community identities, the overarching message, preservation is part of that, but it's gonna take um, very specific work and skill sets to kind of get there. But just a brief follow up to Ray, um, citizens really do care whether they're in a low income neighborhood, whether they're in a, you know, a posh suburb, the things that they value, the kind of things that create authenticity for their local community. Um, so just an example here in Pittsburgh, I mean, we have this neighborhood called the Hill District. It's now kind of uh, primarily African-American. hundred years ago, it was Italians, Jews, and Syrians and Lebanese, and then Blacks from the South moved in. The uh, Pittsburgh was one of the three great jazz capitals at that time, St. Louis, Chicago, and Pittsburgh. I guess you could say New Orleans, but there's many great jazz stars came out of the Hill District it was in the, and they had the major national newspaper. The Pittsburgh Courier was the most important African-American newspaper in the country. Uh, August Wilson grew up there and all his nine plays are about living in the Hill District. And there's still a lot of work to be done in the Hill District. There's a theater that's falling down, August Wilson's house. Um, is is now been designated and people are raising money to do it. But it's interesting when you go through the public public planning process, you know, people with very little means, struggling day to day, they love to engage on these things about their heritage. And they want to preserve that. They, they feel a great loss if something goes bad, like a, a, a historic barbershop closes down after three generations. Uh, a, a famous little... Um, restaurant that served the best spaghetti in the Hill District and also ribs, you know, closed down. People were very upset about it. So when the new library was built on that site, there was, there was some history preserved about that particular little restaurant as part of the, library, the new library itself. And the neighborhood very much appreciated that. In fact, embraced the library much better because that legacy was celebrated in the library itself. Wonderful, wise words from, from everybody. And so as students are thinking about what facet and where the trajectories, where their career might take them, here are some, some things to keep in mind, some, some ideas about uh, places we might push and grow and expand the purview of what's core preservation. Thank you so very much to each of our three presenters today and for this wonderful discussion. Um, thank you to everybody for tuning in and uh, look forward to finding opportunities to speak with you each again in the future moving along. Thank you, Amalia, for being yes. a great moderator. Thank you. And it was for a pleasure. To be part of this. Thanks, thanks, Amalia. And thanks to all the other speakers. It was really great to be on this panel and I hope that the students and others got something out of it and uh, happy for any follow-up. And a hello to Paul Cap and Michael. <laughs> yes, the rest of the conference committee. Yes. Yeah. Thanks to everybody. It was a pleasure.